Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And in this episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about strongholds, bases for your player characters. And you know what they say, Paul? Location, location, location. So are your player characters going to settle in Aquilonia or Rhyme Isle or Mount Doom? We will hash that out today on Wandering DMs. Oh, Dan, I totally dropped the call there for a second. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm back. Did you miss me? Did you notice I was gone? I, I, I very much so. <laughs> very much so. You need a stable base, Paul. You need a stable base where you're located. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and we were discussing uh, just prior to this um, that uh, that we well we don't have like a like a large outline for different points we want to hit on this. We do have kind of the same big high level question, which is simply: Should you include this in your game at all? I totally agree with that, and so I have a grab bag of memories, and so I think between you know you and I, Paul, we've we've experimented with different ways of player bases, and of course we're thinking, uh, including you know castles, which is a, a prominent feature in traditional D and D, as well as other things like maybe your players buy an inn and they stay there, or maybe they buy a house in town, or maybe they're they're living with their henchmen on a ship, possibly. Um, mm. so, uh, so I, I, got, I actually I, have I a lot agree. to say about a... boats. Good. <laughs> I have a lot to I, say that, about well, that boats. warms my heart. <laughs> and I'm sure it warms <laughs> Dave Arneson's heart too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think one of the tricky things about it, of course, is that, you know, particularly having a castle is traditionally the end game of D and D and you don't hit that mm -hmm. point until ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th level. And how many people actually get to that point? So the amount that that was actually tested in uh, the traditional D and D game rules, eh, not so much. How how well does it interface with what we normally think of as D and D? Um, yeah. That is a little, still a little bit of an open question. I feel like if you go back to the older texts, like like original edition D and D, or even say the expert book in DX, um, a lot of energy is put into the the. Uh, the where's and why's and how's of building the stronghold, right? How much does it cost? How much labor do you need, right? All those details, but there's really no detail about, well, what is the game like at that point? How does that impact the play? Totally agree. Which I guess is totally typical of those, of those early books, right? A lot, of, a lot of time is spent on the details and not much spent on the broad picture of like, well, what the hell's the game anyway? How are we supposed to play this thing? <laughs> you know, I want to. You know, I want to bring up. Let's look at the. Let's look at the construction table in original D and D. So, uh, in the in the very, I pulled up the very first printing of original D and D in the DM's book, and um, you get this this page of construction options, and I feel like this page is just so delightful because, <laughs> and this is this is it, right? And there's no there's no explanatory yeah. text for what these things are, or what they, they, they do for you, but a whole page are devoted to, to these hand-drawn pictures of <laughs> components of a castle, of towers and the keep and walls and barbicans and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. even the annotations are handwritten, right? <laughs> and so I feel, I'm just so delighted by this early, yeah. really hobbyist, and this was the actual publication to actual Dungeons and Dragons in the first printing, and I, I think, and, my, my, and someone could correct me, but I feel like this is probably Dave Arneson's work. This is the uh, this is the kind of work that uh, that Arneson would do of pretty war gamey, a lot of detail, and I think that the art here matches other examples of Dave Arneson's art there. Um, and that is even the label construction is clearly hand <laughs> hand filled in. A little bold face version. You have a table of like extra like doors and gates and portcullises and things like that and stairs. Um, and and that's how uh, DIY it was initially is this page of actual handwritten <laughs> notes on yeah. components that you could add and to a castle. And it's so enticing, right? It feels like, oh, I really want to engage with this part of the game. But how? <laughs> Oh, Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly how I feel. This is exactly how I feel all the time. Is I get you know I got excited about that as a, as a teenager and before, and um, uh, uh, yeah, and of course this was you know carried forward and lightly edited in all the early editions of D and D. It's first edition has this. The expert, the the, the basic expert rules have this. 
And it definitely looked like, well, this is this is what you're aiming for. This is ultimately what your mm -hmm. player characters are aiming for, and I want to get to that point really badly. Yeah. Now, I, I hate I hate to pick at sore wounds here, Dan, but uh, the the thing that I'm immediately reminded of is how the games that you ran of outdoor spoliation kind of evolved over the years at Helgacon. Um, so so Dan has traditionally always run this game. Uh, and it's sort of like a, it's almost episodic, right? It's almost uh, kind of a serial game where you started with the equally um, unclear rules on outdoor <laughs> adventuring in ODD, right. right? Where it's just like, get out your copy of uh, Outdoor Survival, right? And good luck with that. <laughs> Here are some tables. Um, yeah. And and I remember you you I remember you specifically talking about how like it was just it felt like you were coming to the table with so little that you were really paranoid that there was no way you were going to fill a whole game with mm -hmm. like the tiny mm -hmm. amount of content you were walking to the table with, and it went off like gangbusters, right? Everyone loved it. We roamed around the wilderness. We we encountered strange <laughs> monsters and uh, uh, you know happened upon castles and keeps of of NPCs that we weren't sure are they good are they evil we don't know. Um, and it was super fun, right? So over the years, rather than just replaying the same thing, you kind of did the continuation, right? So the next year, maybe we were a level higher, maybe a level higher. And eventually that kind of culminated in, we raided a, a castle, I think, and, and claimed it for our own. We're like, this is ours now. And then the next year you began with, great, you own this castle. Yeah, I think I think I mean you over the over the couple of years we were playing that I think um, the characters knocked over over several castles, <laughs> and then yeah. the thing that changed is at some point they went well you know what this one we're gonna stay at this one and I was like oh okay well that's okay that's different, and so that you know quickly impinges on uh, transitioning the game from roving bands of near duel happy you know band of brothers to uh, running domains. And um, and that kind of highlights. I will point out in original D and D, there they, you have these costs on this page. There's nothing about construction times or labor. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So I'll say that the one time uh, when I was playing as a teenager, and my characters took the opportunity at high level to build a castle out of the expert rules, never even occurred to me. I don't think just hand wave money. Money comes off your character sheet. A castle is present now, um, and so. <laughs> It's totally what I think. Pretty much exactly what happened, and my character, my my players did actually design a castle on graph paper once. But yeah, in this uh, in this more recent game with uh, with tasteful adult players, um, you know, maybe it, what we discovered was it's it's far easier for high level characters, particularly when you have a whole band of them, to just knock over an existing castle and take it over. Um, yep. You don't even have to. You just just skip the whole price costing layout labor issues and just say, well, you know, just, just, I'm just going to take one. And um, <laughs> if you've got, if you've got a whole group and for us, we were playing with as many as 10 or 12 players, actually all that level. And you attack a castle with a bunch of normal people and maybe one single high level leader. It's very, uh, uh, you know, very possible to fairly easily take it over. And that, is a much more efficient way of taking over the castle. Now, the problem was, as you're pointing out, and I totally agree, the discovery was that year when I came in to actually use some, I wasn't planning on the whole game being domain play, but I came in and you have to make some decisions about what are you gonna invest in, who are you gonna hire, what things do you want, you know, what magic items do you want to try constructing? And the game just ran into a brick wall, particularly with, some players wanting to engage in that and some players not wanting to engage in that. And some players wanted to dig in, were, were really enthusiastic about that, which I thought was great, and really wanted to dig into that deeply. And some players wanted to keep playing normal D&D. &D, and how can you, how can you not respect that? Yeah. I, I want to go out and I want to be adventuring with monsters and caves, and I don't want to spend any time at all with a spreadsheet doing middle management chores. Um, and yeah, I had, I had a problem at my table and I didn't foresee it. And it's 100% my fault for not seeing that. So I do think there's a big, big danger there as you, as the game suddenly becomes a completely different thing, um, that you probably need to check in with your players, have a conversation and maybe 
maybe that totally different gameplay, maybe that's really more for solo play uh, by email, perhaps. With, with it. And the other thing I find is that it's very awkward, right? The whole concept of being a liege lord, I mean, in reality, that's one person. It's not an oligarchical group run by a committee. So I find that a lot of a lot of adventures and stuff try to manage that fairly awkwardly of like, well, you're, you know, you're a lord, you're a medieval lord, but you're also just kind of a democratic group as well. Uh, but, you know, just you five or six. And I find that gets really, really awkward at that point. So there's a lot of trouble spots mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say that I feel like that progression is the, is exactly what I see in this, uh, in, in my entire history of playing this, whether it was, you know, you're now barons and own this castle, or even just you bought a nice house together in this town because this is the town you hang out in all the time, or uh, you bought a ship so that you can go from, you know, landmass to landmass to go adventuring. Regardless, inevitably, it falls down for me into some players love to dig into all the details of, you know, let me outfit my room, my, you know, the guards, the, you know, the staff of our nice house, the, the crew mm -hmm. of our pirate ship, right? They want to get into all the nitty gritty details of maintaining that thing. And then half the tables rolling their eyes and saying, well, when do we get the fight? Right? Like, this is boring. Yeah. What happened to adventure? Right now we're just... Now we're just stewards of this building or, you know, yeah, middle management tasks, as you point out, right? <laughs> it falls into that very rapidly. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I keep running. I mean, I personally keep running into this this danger as, as a game runner of, you know, you've seen that in our outdoor spoliation games. And again, I, you know, I, I've always been a dungeon master. So I've always had the the whole book in front of me and I've mm. always seen those and those illustrations, right? I mean, they're like a lot of original D&D &D is illustrated. It's like just raw text. And you see those nifty pictures of castles uh, in original D&D &D by Arneson, or I think there's a, there's in the expert rules, there's this lovely piece of art by Bill Willingham that I just adore all the time that attracts my eye there. I want to see this. And then I run into this game. Well, there you go. So, um, so we don't, we don't, we don't honestly give, we don't usually show the love that we hold for the Moldvay Cook basic expert rules on camera. So I'm really, I'm so glad that you pulled up this page <laughs> from the expert rules because there's the art by Bill Willingham and just slightly edited list of castle elements, just like we saw, I yeah. think, in Arneson's yeah, work it's there. The, it's basically the same content, right, from the right? OD&D page we looked at, except not handwritten, right? Like now it's okay, right. nice and tables and nice print, but it's still ultimately just, here are the costs for all the bits and bobs of how to build your castle, and no guidance whatsoever for what the heck does the game turn into when <laughs> when you own a castle. Uh, 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 Stephen Wendell there uh, agrees with me, Frank. Favorite page. <laughs> favorite page of the book, yep. and I totally agree with Stephen on that, as a matter of fact. And uh, yeah, same, same content. Uh, he, he adjusted the prices a bit. The, same, the second table is the same supplemental table for stairs and doors and trap doors and all kinds of stuff like that, um, which is so delightful. So I have had, uh, I have actually have had player characters at a particular level turn through this page and construct a dungeon, uh, construct a castle on graph paper playing in the, the basic D&D &D known world. Um, and so, you know, and, and then, you know, and then the game changes a bit. So I don't know if you, you remember this, Paul, but you and I met at a video game company in Boston, low these many years ago, called Genetic Anomalies, that was later uh, purchased by THQ, if anybody remembers that big video game company. And at least when when I started there, there were a lot of ideas at this at this company that that we started at for what is the next game we're going to make. And at one point, there were discussions of for a fantasy, massively multiplayer online game, as we were thinking about, might be a possibility. And so I came up with this design of like, you can be adventurers and you're going into dungeons and you're getting treasures and then you're gonna level up. And at some point you start unlocking capacities to become the master of the world. And you can start building your own dungeons and you can start building your own castles and make protection for the gold and the treasures that you've gotten from your adventures and so forth. And I was personally really excited about it. And then your players start to become content creators of the world and isn't this great 
And again, somebody had to turn to me and go, Dan, you realize that's a totally different game. And yeah, yeah. not everybody <laughs> wants like is like you wanting to be the dungeon master full time all the time. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. God, you're right. Not everybody. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I've had to get this. Yeah. I've had to get this message delivered to me multiple times, including the very first place that you and I met, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it's, it's tough. Now, I've uh -huh. had I've had cases where the party does align. I want to I want to talk a little bit about boats. Let's talk about boats. Uh, I have a long history of dealing with dealing with this problem in boats. Um, and, uh, spoilers coming here for folks who haven't watched, uh, TDR or, uh, don't know the Warhammer, uh, classic Warhammer campaign that we ran in TDR, which was called The Enemy Within. But here you go. This is the cover of, mm. uh, what is now called Part 2, but in the original printing was Part 3, uh, Death on the Reich, uh, where this part of the adventure, the party gets a boat, right? They get a boat and they're introduced to a larger swath of the empire and they have this map of rivers they can run up and down. And they're encouraged to partake in mercantilism, right? Of like, hey, you can transport goods from town A to town B. And it totally turns into, again, that kind of bookkeeping, you know, middle management stuff. Now, in TDR, I tried to boil this down. I tried to simplify it as best I could. And I presented it to the players. I was like, here's an optional thing you can engage in. If you want, you own this boat. You can move goods up and down. And it took maybe one session before all of them were like, nope. Nope, nope, don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. They yep. they basically hired an NPC to live on the boat and deal with the merchant stuff. And like, you just, you know, <laughs> load up goods for us and sell goods as we move around. Just make a profit for us and give us a share. Whatever, that's your job. We're going to just use the boat as transport to get from place to place and do fun adventures. Um, so, so that's interesting. Um, unusual, I, I'd say. That I, I lucked into a group where all four of them were like, "Yep, this is this is what we want. This is not what we want." Um, but uh, but yeah, I I've had, you know. So the other okay, <clears throat> sorry. The other classic problem with this is yeah. guess what happens at the beginning of part three of um of the uh, enemy within. Probably the boat sinks. The boat sinks exactly. The boat <laughs> sinks. You take the boat away from them. The boat sinks. <laughs> and I have, I have I have run that countless times now where the party, you know, and I've had cases I remember in high school running a campaign where the party needed to get to some far off place. And I thought maybe they'll rent a boat, maybe they'll buy a boat, maybe they'll steal a boat. I don't know. They bought a boat and then spent an entire session outfitting the boat. They all got into it. They were all super excited. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay. i got to sink this thing. The, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the plot of the adventure they're about to go is they go to this remote island and the boat sinks and they get stuck there. Like, that's the plot of the adventure. And now they're going to hate me when I sink this boat. <laughs> You know, I have so I have such uh, a love for boats, and actually, right behind my uh, see that red uh, that what yeah. says that red book and that blue book right there are books on medieval yeah. shipping. Actually, that I try to feed into my games like that, and I have I'll I'll confess I really I mean I want to get it right enough that I've wound up not actually doing it. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, so I'm always I always find this you know very enticing and you know as you as you say that I'm like oh right you can on the rivers and you know what the rivers have only you know uh limited places you can go so it's actually like a dungeon and, and it's very manageable oh i, I want to do that so much um now what this river actually, trade what is a very done, interesting thing i would yeah. say and and it's presented yeah. really like if you want to see it presented well in an interesting way for a game look at death on the reich very fascinating too much in depth i think it's too in depth and unless you have the right group of players they're going to reject this you know, or half of them are going to yeah. reject it and half of yeah. them are going to love it. And then some people are bored and some people love it. But like, yeah, yeah, it, it is nice, right? Because you have all these, how long does it take to get from this city to that city? And how much money does it cost? And what is the cost of this good versus that good at these different cities? And it's mm -hmm. all in there. So uh, it's one of these yeah. things whereby that whole, those whole issues of like both running a domain and possibly trade and stuff are just gently, just gently uh, implied in original D&D sources, and like there's this there's this part in um, in original D&D on making baronies. I think I can just hold it up here. That says here's some stuff that um, you could possibly um, invest in, 
right? Here's some stuff. Road building, canals, inns, hunting. <laughs> That's it. There's no detail. The DM has to make up all that stuff. And I think, as usual, um, that is a, a massively cut down version of something that Dave Arneson wrote. And you can see the fuller version in his first fantasy campaign, frankly, along with some other stuff that you might want to not want to see. Um, so the, the whole details of actually running it were never either domains or wars or trading were never fully detailed in classic D&D. The thing that this does make me think of is I played quite a bit of classic Star Frontiers, which, which I very much like. And in the spaceship set, the, the Star Frontiers Nighthawk set, they do have a fully formed system for running a spaceship, traveling between different stars and doing trade between in different interstellar systems. And they have like the difference between uh, an agricultural systems products versus an industrial systems products. And you can buy one here and sell one there for a higher amount of money. So I have actually, you know, played that in terms of spaceships. And look, for for teenagers, for what it's worth at the time for teenagers, you know, some of us would look at those, like one of my players would look at the table and go, I can get 50,000 credits just for one single ship's worth of cargo. I love it. Definitely do yeah. that. I just got 50,000 credits and I didn't have to fight or anything and put my life on the line or anything. That's great. Um, and nowadays that you know moving around particular integer values on the character sheet might not be quite so exciting for a lot of us mm. and we want some slightly more narratively impactful experience from our game but uh once upon a time that was that was enough leveling up and getting money you know was actually enough of an excitement to um you know to count as a, as a great experience now the other thing playing with Star Frontiers, and I don't know if you thought about this with your the ship's going to sink issue, is that if you do get in a fight on the high seas or in outer space, it might be, you know, one roll and, okay, the ship blew up and, well, that's a TPK. <laughs> that was a one roll <laughs> TPK. The whole, you have no chance, you're in outer space or the deep sea or something like that, and everybody mm -hmm. just drowned and you could, and there's the possibility at that scale of wiping out the entire party with one single die roll that's happening at a different scale of action. And nobody, I, I don't think anybody's gonna be happy with that, particularly when you know none of the players had any control over that at that moment. Right. And also like, how well, do you decide on the action? And like, who's, you know, maybe you can split it up like I'm the navigator, you're the gunner or something like that, but it's still kind of awkward. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this problem even in, when we're talking about like the ship sinks, right? Let me, let me focus in on that, the ship sinks, right? Um, I've, I've also seen this problem where the players buy a, a nice house or a tavern in town. Mm -hmm. Where like we always go back to this town, we're going to buy this tavern, we're going to mm -hmm. hire a barkeep to run it while we're away, but it's a place for us to come back to and, and call home. Um, and and that falls in the same problem as the castle problem of some players just get really into like outfitting mm -hmm. their rooms and stuff, and then <laughs> other players are like, "Can we please leave and stop playing housekeeping the role playing game?" Um. Uh, by the way, you know, this is endemic. Sorry, I'm, I'm all super into a tangent now, but like, I remember when I was listening to Critical Role, it happens to them. They they absolutely okay. get a house in a town and they spend half a session at least describing how they decorate their rooms. And I'm like, okay. wow. Okay. Really, some <laughs> of them are really into it and some of them are like rolling their eyes going, can we please just move on? Um, anyway, Absolutely. sorry. So I've had cases where they spend a bunch of time, they get very invested in that, and then like the town gets attacked, right? Like something horrible happens, it gets invaded, the whole town is 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 trashed, right? Invaded by hobgoblins, and they kill the Baron uh, while the players are away, or or what? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the players are there and they just fail to defend the town because mm -hmm. Dan Collins is running the uh, other side in the Book of War <laughs> game that simulates the attack. Uh, that, that happens sometimes. <laughs> or maybe they and were so challenged like, to a joust, Paul. Yeah, maybe they were challenged to a joust. No, in this case, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, the Siege of Bridge Fair, if you remember that. Um, yep. So, so yeah, the town gets destroyed. And the thing is that the, the, the tavern or the t house or the boat They've kind of become another character at that point, right? The players have have mm -hmm. 
spent all the time customizing it, that it's like this jointly held character, and you've just just fiat taken it away, right? It's just as bad as, like, you die no save, right? I agree. That character's just gone. Tough. Disintegrate spell. Done. Right? Like, yes, yes, some of us are okay with having that mechanic in it. Um, but I think especially in the case of, like, the boat sinks because terrible weather, or, or even worse, because the plot demands it. See, right. right. Yeah. That, that, that feels, makes me that feels really bad. Yeah. yeah right. People and so on like the same, it. on the same note, uh, you know, a, a, a traditionally you, you've got all these details for how you construct your castle. And then, you know, and I have had players in, in uh, the basic known world do that. And then d d does it ever come really to play? Like, is it ever, do you ever actually run a siege or an attack on that castle that it winds up making a difference about whether you put a size one tower here or a size two tower or one layer of curtain walls versus yeah. two. And yeah. it, you know, you could, if you, on the one hand, it's very easy for a DM. And I think that this is, this is very much how, you know, classic DMs get a bad name to go, well, I want to make it interesting. I want to make the, the design of your castle matter. So on Wednesday, there's an invasion. There's an invasion. You're getting you're getting you're getting besieged, and there's orcs coming over the walls. Um, but I I personally, as DM, get uncomfortable by with this this fiat. I'm just going to attack to take away your stuff because it's there. It seems like a very an overly easy gesture to make, yeah. frankly. So yeah. if I were going to do that, I would only be comfortable if I had a rigorous system. And some people in the chat are suggesting like other books that have those types of systems that I can fairly roll on that you're not getting attacked every single season because that's the only thing I D as DM could think of. But yeah. classic D and D never had such a system. So, uh, so I personally have actually never attacked the player's castle because it didn't, it honestly didn't seem fair to me because it was too obvious a thing to do frankly and therefore the design of the castle never mattered so you're kind of damned Ooh. if you do and damned if you don't on that. yeah i will say that the boat issue is a little different just because boat is also transport right it's also mm -hmm. a, yep. a means to an end of we need to get to this location and i remember in that high school game i played um and this uh sorry this is such a weird technical side note but specifically i was trying to run the game quagmire x6 um, yeah, funny you should bring that up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm kind of curious what you have to say about that module, Dan. I know uh, I see in your notes here that uh, it features. But um, so so I think the plot of that was, for me, in that case, was it Quagmire? Actually, you know, I'm pretty sure the Quagmire starts right with, like, you receive a message in a bottle kind of thing. Go find this mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Yep. So... Um, Right, so I sank their boat, and they were just super, super upset about it, and it turned into a horror show where one player decided they were going to go down with the ship. And oh, geez. <laughs> and see? It's others, very like, easy to happen. The shore. <laughs> and then they were just yeah. so mad at each other, by the end they got they ended up getting into a fight with each other. And they let, you know, so we had this bloodbath on the beach scene, where it's just like, all right, we're not, <laughs> we're not playing this one at all. Let's just kill each other at this point, fine. Um... <laughs> On the other hand, if you watch TDR, the interesting thing that happens in TDR is I just decided not to sink the boat, and I just continued to present the content. And the interesting thing is the content moves to an area that's not accessible by boat, right? And so, you know, does it matter that the players have a boat docked somewhere? I kind of figured probably not. And interestingly, what the players on TDR ended up doing is they said, well, we have to go do this thing, and we're going to be gone for months. We're just going to give the boat to the NPC. And like, oh. You did a great job. Congratulations. The boat is yours now. And I was so delighted wow. by that outcome, frankly. It was a delightful yeah, outcome because I was wow. like, great, now I have a friendly NPC with a boat in the world. Like, I can use that. <laughs> right? That that's, is a wonderful... Thank you for that present, players. <laughs> as, as traditional DMs, that's so shockingly surprising because it's so antithetical to the way that we normal d and players normally work. Of just like be, <laughs> being charitable like that. I don't know what the name. That's whatever that is. That's the anti murder hobo. I, there's there's going to be some proper name for just roaming around giving away massive treasures to nice people. That's I'm not used to that, admittedly. Uh, charitable hobos. <laughs> that's great. 
yeah. that's, it was that's fantastic. I was, I was super pleased about it because yeah. I was like, I love just having that research. Anytime they invent, I love it when my players invent NPCs or make minor NPCs major because they decide they like them. Like, great, cool. Yeah, yeah. That's content in my let me world. Throw up, let me let me throw up a, a comment by uh, by Joshua Macy here in the cat in the chat that that I think is a great idea, and it pro- I wasn't smart enough to come up with this on my own for a long time. And Josh is saying on the point of are you going to attack your player's castle or townhouse or sink their ship? Uh, Josh is saying I actually explicitly tell my players that I'm not going to do that. Um, it limits me as GM, but what I have to do to get them invested and in, and in other things like that. And um, so I, uh, I I think that's a really I think that's a really fair idea actually. And mm-hmm. so when in my last uh, long running D and D campaign, the players kind of like you're saying, Paul, wound up buying a, a house in town. And, you know, and it's funny because at one point they, they started to get up in levels. They had some money and I actually handed them that page from original D&D with the construction possibilities. And the player I handed it to just kind of crossed his eyes and went, I can't follow what, I don't understand what this page is trying to get me to do. <laughs> and we're just like, I don't, I don't know what this entails. I'm like, okay. We're we're in a different place situation. Fantastic. And I said, well, you can buy you can buy a house for this amount of money. And they went, great. We buy this house. And so as uh, William also said in the chat a while back, he said, um, I think the steward seneschal major domo NPC is a must for any home base. Let me actually put that on screen right now. So there's William saying, yeah, I think the steward seneschal major domo NPC is a must for home base. Ironic because I do think of William himself as the major domo for the Wandering DMs channel, actually, as he manages the chat. <laughs> like so that's a little bit of a made a comment. I don't know if William realized that. And, 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 and that ex- excellent idea is exactly what I did with that, with the characters' uh, townhouse in their last games. I brought in uh, a, an NPC butler. And I, and I think another really easy thing to do is to have the, uh, the sinister vizier character of like the, the, the character comes in to take control of your house and then three sessions later, oh, flip the script. They're an evil spy and they steal all your stuff that you've been storing there and stuff like that. And so I felt that it was a bit of a switch to very um, scrupulously, like Josh and William were saying, absolutely not do that and have mm-hmm. this particular NPC be completely trustworthy and uh, have a little bit, of, a little dash of Alfred Pennyworth and a little dash of Radar O'Reilly so that uh, when one of the characters go, geez, I really wish that we had an X, the, the, char- the NPC would just walk in the room and go, hey, I got you an X. <laughs> right At that, and 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 my my players were starting to go oh there's going to be some complication i guess we have to go shopping for whatever and just have the npc just walk in the room and go hey i thought you well, might need an x i got it for you <laughs> that's amazing and right that's and so fantastic. that actually cleared up right that allowed us to actually yeah. make the game uh, work a lot more smoothly and mm-hmm. uh instead of my my terrible mistake with our outdoor spoliation games of throwing domain management on people who didn't didn't want it, use that mechanic to actually smooth out a whole bunch of details that none of us are interested in. Um, and so using good. using the using the explicitly trustworthy major domo or NPC of your ship to manage that stuff that actually made a lot of a lot of flexibility. It actually made a lot of very nice things in the game. As a matter of fact. And I enjoyed playing that character too. I actually really enjoyed playing the <laughs> walk in with a hey, I resupplied the wine cellar in case you want a big party tonight. Just right after they go, we should hold a big party. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think it I think you must delight in it so much because players so don't expect that from a Dan Collins run game. You know? Well <laughs> what? Clearly, clearly this guy's got other motives. We can't trust him. Fire kill him. Kill the major double. Kill him right now. Don't trust him. <laughs> that was what was happening. That was exactly what was happening, and it was it was really fun to play off that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, people in the chat are saying, and of course, you know, it, it's funny because in original D and D, there there's most traditional D and D, and this is still in fifth edition, have the issue of uh, you know how do you upkeep your characters in town over time, and there might be. A uh, price list, and third edition had like what style of life do you have? 
original D and D has this. Uh, uh, you've got to pay one percent of your experience, your current experience, in gold per month to upkeep it, if I recall correctly. But if you buy, if you get a stronghold or a base, then that goes away. And that's that's the primary advantage to having a castle or a base, at least in original D&D, is that your monthly upkeep just goes away. Now, interestingly, in first edition, that flipped around, so now you have to pay for maintenance of the castle instead. Uh, but uh, it, it, I think that I think the the instinct there was good of have the stronghold clean up some ephemeral details like upkeep or what you're eating or where you're living or your ammunition or things like that. Um, and I think that's a very good instinct of have it have it uh, clean up some stuff that you don't want to think about anymore. Now, I will I will say I want to go back to um, like you know simply making explicit that you will never uh, attack their boat or their stronghold or whatnot. Um, that one case where we did run a book of war game against the town that the that the players had been kind of considering their home base for the whole campaign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that was born not of like a, this is your home base I want to destroy it uh, it might have been a little bit born of like hey book of war the promises you can work into your D&D campaign I want to see if that's true um, but but more so it just came from the plot of the game as it was unfurling that routinely throughout the D&D campaign that we were playing there was this threat of there's this invading force and it's building up and like one of these days it's going to land on our shores it's going to be bad um, and I just wanted to, I wanted to realize that. And then, and then I thought, oh, this is also a chance to like test out Book of War and really, uh, really play it out. Um, of course, you know, I think actually, if I think back, I think I actually did successfully kind of defend the town. Not really because, um, uh, because I think like a huge section of the town got destroyed and the, there was a power shift in who was in charge of the town as a result, right? So things definitely changed. They did repel the invaders, ultimately. But uh, I think, uh, if I call, mm-hmm. uh, there was a straight Might necromancer. Might have different memories about escaped. that. I think there was a necromancer who escaped somewhere that they later had to go hunt down because they were like, okay, evil necromancer hiding, it's hiding out somewhere in our, in our town that we care about. But it was a lot of fun. And the point was, I didn't have a preconceived notion of the outcome, right? I didn't actually yeah, have any right. investment into whether the, the town was going to get destroyed or saved. I was like, I'm curious. I could, I could reduce it to a coin flip or a die roll, but instead, let's let's play a fun war game, and, and that will dictate the outcome. So, so I want to say there are cases where it is fun to play out. But like, yep, attack the town, attack the stronghold, do it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you, yeah, I, I feel like like we want to do, it. and I will point. I will just as a little side note about that particular game. Book of War has this funny tendency to come down to like one figure on both sides. And for some weird reason that I can't figure out about half the time, the the two sides decimate each other down to one character, one figure each. And that's pretty close to what happened that game actually. So we, we had giant armies filling up this giant table and you had it in what, 10 millimeter even? I was using um, 10 millimeter to, figures to begin yeah, with. To make it really massive. And they were just massive battles on both sides, massive swings on both sides. And then there's this like desperate, desperate last scene of I basically just got one necromancer. I'm just down to one guy and 10 skeletons. And there's one figure of player characters on the other side, uh, busting through this hole in the wall of the, of the town. Um, and that has a funny tendency to happen with book of war for some reason. So it was, yeah. it was mass devastation on both sides, uh, yeah. in that nice. game. So I mean, you you kind of want that. I mean, as I as I think about it again, I could imagine, and I've I've done stuff like this in other you know wilderness gamings of making the mechanics completely transparent to the players, so they know um, what decisions to make as far as what part of the world is dangerous or less dangerous. And I could imagine similarly having a system for you know domain events or things that could happen in town on a monthly basis for a random world, and just showing it to the players. And say, if you build a castle, here's the table that I'm going to run and roll on quarterly. And there's a 2% chance that there's an orcish invasion each month based on where you are. And is that, are you happy? Are you comfortable with the decision to build here? And I could at least imagine that is something I would personally be, be comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. Hmm. Hmm. 
All right, I want to know, Dan, um, why why is X six on your list to talk about? I was so happy. Bring up. Let me. Let's look at it. Let's. Look, so so okay. some people may not know this classic module. The um, so this is the wilderness map from Dungeons and Dragons expert module X six Quagmire. And uh, so in the whole X series, uh, that's where in the known world, you're at, you're at the level where you can adventure in the wilderness. So every single module expanded the known world with a, with a big wilderness map. And um, you can see that this is somewhat awkward in the book. It's a two page layout. And on the one hand, you wanna hold it um, portrait style, the way that it's mapped, but they put the text landscape style because you're probably gonna open it up that way. So it's a little bit awkward. As, as usual in these products, um, every hex is 24 miles in size. So the reason why I pulled out this out is this is where my player characters built their castle. So, oh, interesting. And, and it's well, because you and I have just slightly different opinions of this adventure, I guess. I mean, we both have weird experience with it, I guess. I guess that's a commonality. So my player characters got the message in the bottle and they came to this area and they scouted out the sinking cryptic cities in this giant swamp land in the middle. And the thing, and I was like, eh, my, my critique of all of those, uh, all of those adventures is that they, they, they maximally suffer from the giant howling wilderness that's totally empty issue. And so this, if you, the scale of this map is, it's about the same size as Europe frankly. Okay, broadly speaking, it's it's somewhat it's somewhat larger than Europe. Um, okay. And there are exactly two inhabited communities on this map. And you can see kind of on the northern third over on the left, uh, there's this the, the, the neck of the peninsula where this trade route goes across. The only two communities in this entire map are on either end of that um, trade route there that goes across the peninsula. And what are they called? Sea Mule and Mule Beach and Sea Coast sea or something Campbell. like that. There you go. So those are the only two communities, and one is a fairly small town, and one is an unwalled village. And in this entire right. area, and then, and then you have some, some ruined areas that are supposed to be the adventurers. And other than that, there is absolutely no human life in this entire Europe-sized map. So my players uh, did the adventure here. And then they went, wait a minute, this whole, this place, there's no kingdom here. There's no defenses. So we could easily just take over this whole thing. And so they, yeah. they went back to the civil, normal civilized uh, lands, got a couple of ships, hired some mercenaries with the costs that are in the book that were very affordable for them and came back and just knocked over these two cities. And now they own this whole territory. Because apparently it's <laughs> there's, there's no competitors and there's no opposing kingdoms or anything like that, and it's just all theirs. And so um, it's uh, it was on Sea Camel in the town where they built their castle, as a matter of fact. So that right there is where my player took a piece of graph paper and said, here's my castle. And then I'm like, wow, I guess they can just have like a Europe-sized empire, I guess, if they want. What do I do now? And there was just like all kinds of question marks in my head. But that is where my players made their base and actually made the one castle according to the original rules. Fascinating. That's what's there. That yeah. is. Yep. So very yeah, much on I, my mind. And I, I've made maps of those hexes and I know exactly where the river runs because I was thinking about thinking about those kinds of issues. And I think maybe I'd add one invasion of the small village or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm intimately familiar with that map because that is where my players made their base. I definitely spent a lot less time on the wilderness side of this module. It was really just about get to this remote location via ship so that we can investigate. Um, I like, I really like the uh, interesting um, gimmick of this particular module, which is that there are three locations that are all identical in theory, right? There's three locations that have the yeah. same interior, three towers, they all have the same map, but They've undergone different changes, like one is sunk into a swamp, right? Or one's underwater or something. I can't remember exactly, but they're mm -hmm. very different once you get there based on the contents and what's happened to them over time. And that's that's a trope that I've stolen and adapted to my own. I wrote my own module that, that uses that trope because I like that trope, but I wasn't crazy about the rest of the content in X1. Agreed.
Let me, just, let me just steal that little nugget of an idea and redo it myself. In my uh, opinion, you did it better, Paul. Um, having having you know run this and played in in your game, uh, like my initial impression of this reusing the same dungeon layout of this adventure was that felt frankly cheap to me. It felt like oh, you're just you know mm -hmm. just you're not you're not giving me three maps. You're just giving me one map and saving design time of coming up with a reason why they're all identical. And your um, your adventure, it was actually important to the plot. So it actually became a, a critical issue that we discovered that they were the same and used that to our advantage. And that actually became, that actually had a payoff yeah. to it. Yeah, that it allowed, I didn't the, it allowed get the party to then. Six module. Right. It allowed the party to kind of target, right, further. Like, okay, when we go to location three, we know we need to get from here to here, right? Okay, there's a new, yeah. right? I think in mine, one of them was on top of a mountain and it was all crumbling and falling to pieces. One of them was in a swamp and semi semi submerged and sunken, and the third one was completely inhabited by hobgoblins, and they had taken it over mm -hmm. as their base. Um, and I I want to think that maybe it was that one that you did last, but by then you were like, no, we know the layout, we know where we want to go, we know how to like get in there, <laughs> which was nice. It was a nice payoff. You're like, okay, surgical strike, and, go. And you know what? I will confess, I made a mistake as a player in that game that I did the bit of I did the bit of metagaming myself out of the game of going, oh, I recognize that these are the same structure. And I think at least for a while I was saying, I'm gonna pretend that I don't realize that because it's gonna spoil the game. But then it became and then other players realized, no, we need to use that knowledge about where the stuff that. is. And I was like, oh, I'm just I'm doing the same mistake I tell other people not to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. I, I know that's the only time you've seen me make a mistake in playing D and D, Paul. <laughs> so I'm sure that I'm sure that made a big impact on you. It did. It did. <laughs> I know that Dan was fallible. Really, it got struck, shook my world. I'm glad we have <laughs> one example of that. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if anybody saw uh, Pool of Radiance last Monday, but, um, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that was... You know, it's funny. So, let, me, let me say, yeah. while, I was, while I was researching this, you know, I couldn't help but pull down uh, my, my, my copies of Fritz Leiber's uh, Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Because interestingly, this, this awkward struggle that we have with the game changing when you get to strongholds, absolutely happens in the literature of Fafford and the Grey Mouser. The exact same thing happens with Liber. And of course, Liber wrote those stories for 50 years or more, from the 30s up to almost 1990. And we all know, right, the thing that sticks in our head is Fafford and the Grey Mouser as the pair of near do well adventurers, and they're roaming around, they have a bunch of episodic adventures. And then in 1976, Liber flipped that. And in 1976, there's a story called The Frost Monstream, where they're in a tavern and uh, Fafford says, this is unacceptable. We can't do this anymore. We need to lead men. We need to have a home. We should have wives. And they leave Lankmar and they never come back. And they go to a different part of the world called Rhyme Isle. And it's, in my opinion, it's a much less colorful uh, area. And sure enough, they they take over as lords and they run castles and they have captains and they get they basically get wives. And the whole tone of the stories never recover. They never they never get back to that same place. And it now becomes very much their defenders, and it's very much high fantasy as possibly evil things invade their territory. And the tone is radically different in lots and lots of ways. And it's so fascinating that that exact same issue comes up in the pulp fantasy literature with with Liber's works. He he he, he falls for that exact same problem in late era. I would say it 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 shows up as well in Joel Rosenberg's Guardians of the Flame series, um, which example. is a great series. Love it. Love the first three novels. After that, it gets into uh, he's got a castle and he's got a child, and then maybe so there's there's you know second generation characters and. It's just I, there's a lot of problems, frankly. I think with with the later books, but but I definitely don't make it through them as well as it's not it's not the same. It's not the, it's not the adventure I signed up for, right? The adventure I signed Great up example. for is real world characters get sucked into a D and D world, must survive. 
And now we're in this weird, like, yep, we've lived here for decades. This just is our lives now. And we're settled and, uh, yeah, and domain management and we're, uh, we're middle managers. And, yep, no thanks. Not what I signed up for. I will, I'm going to give, I, unusually, I'm going to give, uh, I, I don't usually call out um, Frank Menser's Beckme rules where he, he finally actually produced a companion set that we've been promised for so many years for, for high level domain type play. And I will, I'll praise that, that um, the, he, he, he puts that up front. He makes it explicit. So um, when you do hit name level, which is to say ninth level in those rules, there's a very explicit decision. Every single class you have to make a decision. Are you going to be a land owning version of a fighter or cleric or magic user? Or are you going to be a traveling fighter, cleric or magic user? And um, so I do, um, I have to salute the making that explicit and making it a decision and what, what the game's, uh, what the, how the game is going to be different on those two different paths. And at least in his later rules, you know, if you are, particularly for fighters, if you're land owning, you're going to become a baron and you're probably going to get a castle and you will get income and you'll be working with a liege probably. And if you decide to become a traveling high level fighter, then that unlocks these subclasses of paladin or knight or avenger, which you can only choose at ninth level in those rules. So, um, you know, whereas in, in uh, other editions, you kind of, you kind of back into it semi by accident at least at least he was making this clear bifurcation clear uh in his rules so plus one plus one for frank menser on that one interesting interesting hmm. and have you ever played with those rules no i use the i use the the mold they cook basic expert um and i did not i did not actually play with stuff after that I think I think like at the end of my high school group, right at the end, we got to the big uh, Red Arrow Black Shield adventure where there is a worldwide conflict and we're playing out the war game. We didn't get to complete it, but hypothetically, the very next thing would be now you are running kingdoms and I, I pro probably would have started using those rules as the next thing possibly. Hmm. Interesting. And like... We have a couple of things that come out of this conversation, Dan, that I like. I like the the there should always be a major domo character, right? Just just build it in right off the bat. You've got an NPC who can take care of things for you. Uh, I also like possibly allowing for players to dig in asynchronously, right? Okay, you want to you want to micromanage the major domo. You want to out lay out the exact outline of your stronghold. Fine, you can do that in your own time. We'll we'll email about it. We'll text about it. Whatever. We'll talk about it. But not at sessions, not at game sessions. That's yeah. not what the game. Yeah, are. agreed. That's my lesson from uh, my outdoor survival uh, problem that I created, and I think some other people have mentioned it in the chat. Is you know if and that's that's great. I mean that is that is that's perfect in a lot of ways. And we know that with Dave Arneson's games and people were lords there, and he was very war gamey. People were calling him on the phone outside of game in order to do stuff. And so that, you know, uh, would make for an excellent, you know, in the old days, play by mail war game or play by email or have a website or something like that to offload that. And that would be something that's really great for one player at a time to interact with. You might only have one player that really wants to interact with that stuff. And great. They can be the lord or they can be the captain of the castle and they can be making those kinds of strategic uh, decisions uh, away from the table, and I think that's a great opportunity. And I have had some experiences with um, with players one on one where they were actually very interested in what they might do at a high level. And so, um, you know, that's a different type of game. It's not five people roused about at a table, but um, that could be a very enjoyable experience. I want to do yep. that. Yeah. And I don't think it, it takes anything away too from the, everyone else's experience. If anything, it gives that player a little moment to shine potentially when uh, you know we're we're running around the uh, the the castle owned by one of the characters, and there are invaders at the gates. And he says, "Ah, but if you remember, GM, I built a sally port in the southeast quadrant." <laughs> yep, you did. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
<laughs> decisions should matter, frankly. Decisions yeah. should matter, right? So, Dan, Dan, we're just about out of time here. Do you have any final thoughts on strongholds in D and D? Well, I think that you you need to be tasteful about it. I think that the you know our experiences have been uh, you want to be careful uh, with with bringing that in and then backing into possibly domain management type stuff. So be, do be aware of how radically that's going to change the tone and the theme and the gameplay of your game. Um, it's you know hypothetically it could very quickly end the whole roving play. And you know, it'd be, it's a little bit unnatural to have this you know band of equal brothers relations. It you know, there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of classic his, history actually of people that were very tight that then have a falling out when they get some power, and then you start having power control relations. And uh, you want to be so that maybe that's an interesting game, but it's very different than what we think of as traditional D and D. So, uh, you know, and, and as, a, as a general rule, I think once in a while, Paul, we say, be careful about inserting other games in your game. Be careful about making a Dagwood sandwich of games and games and games. And the whole managing your stronghold falls in that category. So you have some flexibility. You have some flexibility of dialing in the abstraction level. Ask your players, what, what are you interested? Are you interested in running a castle and running a kingdom? Because we can play a game like that. Or if not, we can avoid it. And so if you if you ask which of those things they're interested in, you can avoid a lot of problems that I have personally created for myself. So you should you should do that. Oh my goodness. Talk to your players. Sage advice. <laughs> it hurts me, Paul. Uh, admittedly, as an old school DM, it kinda hurts my it kinda hurts me. Uh, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's probably what a smart person a wise person at least should do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Viewers, if you have any thoughts on uh, your allowing your play group to build a stronghold or a home, uh, a tavern, a boat, uh, other home base of operations, how that affected your game, uh, content uh, out there in the world where it's in, uh, gamified, maybe where they actually get rules instead of just a table of costs, uh, let us know. Give us a post, uh, post in the comments here in uh, on the YouTube video. Uh, tell us what you think, and uh, maybe we'll incorporate that into part two of Strongholds down the road. Yeah, and we've had some good suggestions in the chat for other stuff already, like maybe a, maybe another uh, episode just on managing downtime in general, and we could dig into upkeeps and creating magic items and training and all that kind of stuff that has uh, you know been different iterations and different editions so um maybe that's that right there but other comments for other stuff I would, we would both really like to see that and of course remember that you can like follow and subscribe to us the wandering dms we are on youtube and twitch twitter facebook github TikTok, and we do have the handle wandering dms on all those sites so take your social media platform of choice and follow us and you'll see updates on upcoming shows if you prefer to listen to the show in audio-only podcast format, you can do so. Those podcasts are available at our website at wanderingdms.com. You can also find it on various podcast carriers, such as Apple, uh, iTunes, uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify. If you're listening to this show right now on one of those sites, please take a moment to rate and review us there. That helps other users of that site find us, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, it really does. And of course, big thanks to our patrons who support the show. And if you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. And we have such a great community actually on our Discord server that you get access to when you join our Patreon actually. And we have great conversations. And after uh, the shows, there are ideas and shows that uh, ideas that fall into the shows. And um, we have uh, a room where people set up games actually on our Discord server. And Paul, you just recently set up a, a painting room that uh, they get you get streamed once in a while, I guess is the plan. So uh, yeah. feel free to join us there, and whichever those things you're interested in, uh, we'd love to see you. Yeah, you may notice the painting room stream come online now and again. That is uh, uh, the 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 not a show show that Wandering EMs has on our on our channel now. Uh, it is not scheduled at any specific time, and it's just sort of like when we feel like it. Um, but basically, there is a. Um, a a video chat room in our Discord server that patrons have access to that they can come on and uh, paint together. And I started to start streaming that sometimes. So you may see that on the show. Uh, if you want to check it out and watch, uh, definitely uh, keep, keep an eye on the channel for announcements of when that comes on. 
or come join the Patreon and be a part of it. I, I enjoyed just hanging out and actually watching several of you guys all community painting the other week actually was like surprisingly enjoyable to me as a matter of fact. Uh, don't forget, of course, in addition to that, we have after show chat. So in about 10 minutes, we will be there to continue this conversation about Strongholds uh, live on video. So um, if you're uh, one of our patrons, we hope you'll see you there. And if you're not, we still hope you'll see we'll see you there by becoming a patron. Just throw a dollar into the, the till and that's that gets you access there. Um, and don't forget about upcoming shows. I will be back tomorrow night for more, for more Pool of Radiance because I am a glutton for punishment. So it's late, late Monday night. Uh, I'll, be, I'll also be back Thursday night for another session of uh, Book of War Season 3, The Most Dangerous Game. And uh, I will be back with Dan Cullinan here for round two of our ongoing session. And then uh, next Sunday, we'll be back and we'll have a special guest. We'll have Mr. Matt Finch of Myth Mirror Games. And we're hoping that we'll be talking to him about his uh, revised edition of the Tome of Adventure design. Paul and I use that on all of our uh, dungeon design dashes here live. So we'll probably have some questions about him about what's in the revised edition that maybe we'll be using in the future. So look forward to that. Awesome. Am I missing yeah, anything, Paul? That's, that's a pretty... That's a pretty full week, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Lots of activity yeah. on this. So, uh, yeah, definitely, which we, we should love to see. So don't forget, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so please, please join us again next week for Mr. Matt Finch and another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.